Hi everyone, it's Crypto Dantes here. So we've got a new sponsor, and we are really excited about this one. It's Macrodisiac, the man, the myth, the legend himself, David Bell. David has recently launched his weekly Macrodisiac email, which is essentially a trader's guide to macroeconomics for less than half a cup of coffee a day. If you follow him already on Twitter under the at Macrodisiac underscore handle, don't forget the underscore there, so that's at macrodisiac underscore, then you'll know already the kind of critical analysis that he brings to the table from his trading background. You'll get a weekly email covering all kinds of macroeconomic themes and topics from the likely impact and effects of central bank and government policy statements to David's own views on the markets and trade ideas he's looking at. So if you want to sign up to his newsletter, it's $24.99 a month. That's £24, British pounds and pence, $24.99 a month, and he'll soon be accepting Bitcoin. So if you're looking for a unique take on the markets, the global economy, and how it all hangs together, then sign up now. The link is in the show notes, so head on over there and you can sign up. This is Jameson Lopp. Welcome to Crypto and Grill. Hi everyone, let's Crypto and Grill. It's Crypto Dantes here and I'm joined as usual with none other than Stig of the Pump. Stig, how are you? I'm good, I'm really good. Back in my basement. Excellent. I always like giving you a location update. It's yeah. quite hot at the moment. Well, we will we will see more about, uh, we'll hear more about the importance of not giving location updates shortly, as I'm sure our guest will uh, will tell us the, uh, uh, the importance of that, or not doing that rather. But... Um, Look for our for our regular listeners. We hope you've enjoyed the last few episodes. We we focused um, more on economics, regulation, and some of the real banking and investment businesses that are starting to now develop and form part of the new digital economy. Um, we wanted to sort of step back to one of our earliest episodes and take a deeper look now at the importance of security um, and also on top of that privacy. Um, there's a lot going on in the world in in Hong Kong and protests in China. And we wanted to try and uh, figure out whether there's a link here between the importance of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So to do that and to have a broad ranging conversation about that, we've got none other than Jameson Lopp with us. Jameson, how are you? Not bad. Glad to be here. Excellent. It's fantastic to have you on and we are really looking forward to this. Um, For the listeners that aren't familiar with you, um, haven't heard of you before, would you mind giving us a quick background? Let us know a bit about yourself, uh, perhaps your education, early career, and we can move on to um, where you are today. Um, I mean, that could probably fill a full episode, so maybe cap it to sort of two minutes or so. That would be great. Sure, sure. I am a computer scientist. I graduated with a computer science degree about 10 years ago, spent the first seven years of my career actually in kind of an anti-privacy role. I was stripping people's uh, privacy away by doing analytics uh, at a very large scale for uh, online marketing companies. So we were sending out 100 million emails a day and ingesting a ton of tracking data. And my job was to write these large cluster analytics jobs that would uh, crunch all of the data and and help marketers figure out how to sell stuff to people even better by specifically targeting them. But I got interested in Bitcoin a number of years ago, uh, both for the ideological uh, perspective and the computer science part. Uh, I found there was actually a very elegant solution to a problem that I had never even thought about. I mean, most people don't really think about how money works. 
And so I got really entranced by the whole idea, went down the rabbit hole, started creating my own projects to better understand Bitcoin, where I, I forked the Bitcoin core project and put in a bunch of analytics data, trying to kind of add in my own expertise and help people out uh, as much as I could. And then eventually I went full time about uh, four years ago and worked for BitGo for three years doing enterprise uh, wallet security, helping power a lot of exchanges and other large companies. And then for the past year and a half, I've been doing a similar role where I'm now the chief technical officer at Casa, where we are also a multi-signature wallet provider, but we're more focused on the personal side. So we're trying to really help people be their own bank, help people fulfill this promise of uh, having sovereignty over your own money, because it's always been technically possible to do that in Bitcoin, but there's been a very high learning curve. So we just want to help bring user friendliness to the, the best security solution that you can have. Okay, so um, that that really sets this up nicely because um, what I wanted to talk about was your your current role at um, at Casa, uh, what you do, uh, what the o- overall objective is, um, and why a person should own a Casa node. So kind of your sales pitch um, to an extent. But just before we get into that, when you talk about monetary sovereignty, what do you mean by that? Because that might be a new concept to people, and and how might a person achieve it, and, and why should they even attempt to achieve it? Well, there's a number of different aspects to that, and uh, there are some people like Trace Mayer, for example, who has kind of uh, deemed it as different classes or even different class citizens of uh, monetary sovereignty. The, the really basic one is being able to control your own money and not having to trust a third party. So, you know, whenever you have money in a bank or in a brokerage or any traditional financial product, you don't actually have direct control over that. You have to go request to a third party that they do something with your money, whether invest it or withdraw it or transfer it. And while these days it may not seem that way because in many cases you can just go on a website and click a few buttons and it feels like you do have control over it. Uh, If you run into an edge case where the third party decides they don't want to fulfill your request, it very quickly becomes obvious that this is not actually your money. It's just someone else uh, who's holding on to your money for you. So in the Bitcoin space, the way that you achieve that is by controlling your private keys. As long as you have the private keys to your coins, no one can uh, decide whether or not you're able to uh, create a transaction, send your money wherever you want. That is kind of the basic level one. The, The next level that we're trying to help people achieve is to actually control what the rules of money are. And the way that you do that in Bitcoin is you run a fully validating node. And this basically ensures that nobody is breaking the rules of the system, the rules to which you agree Bitcoin should actually be. And running a node has been fairly difficult uh, before now, at least running a node that is um, constantly on and... and, uh, it really turns into kind of a systems administration problem. And so that's part of the reason of of why we developed the Casa node to go along with our other products. But I believe that when we have a large set of people who are collectively uh, making individual decisions and creating this new type of organic consensus, basically it creates a much more robust system where we're we're creating a monetary system that has the rules that are the most beneficial to the most number of people, or at the very least, the least harmful to the most number of people. It's a very interesting new type of like governance or, or philosophy or what have you, and people have been arguing about how it works for a number of years now. But it's it's fascinating because it is nothing like the existing system. You have no control whatsoever over the way that the US dollar or the the pound or the euro or anything like that works. You just have to use it. Gotcha. So eh, really fascinating. One of the uh, one of the questions I have probably because a lot of our listeners uh, we expect to early into this or beginners. Could you how would you describe what a node is to uh, Joe Blogs on the streets? And then 
what the difference between a node and mining is, or is there any difference? Yes, uh, and and really it gets complicated because of the long history of this space. And and originally, uh, mo- nodes and miners were synonymous for the first few years of Bitcoin, but but eventually uh, we saw specialization happen, and these two different functions split out from each other. But a node is really just a piece of running software. It's running on a computer. It could be a computer at your house. It could be a computer in a data center. Uh, really, a computer anywhere that is connected to the internet that you have some sort of administrative control over. And it is running uh, one of several different Bitcoin software implementations. Last I checked, there were probably seven or eight different software implementations of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is fundamentally not software. It is rather just a set of rules. And of course, you can... Uh, codify these rules in any programming language you want to. So as long as people are writing their code to uh, verify the same set of rules, then all of these different implementations can talk to each other. They can replicate the data from the Bitcoin network to each other, and they can come to consensus of what the actual data should be. That is, the the transactions and the blocks that comprise this thing that we call the blockchain. But when you're running a node, it means that you are not trusting anyone to be honest to you. And that's because you're going out, you're, you're connecting to a number of other nodes on the network, you're requesting the transaction and block data from these nodes, but then you download it and you actually verify that all of the data follows the rules of the protocol. And so if you are given bad data or you are given a transaction that you know spends the same money twice, all your node has to do is th- reject it. You throw it away. You don't actually have to do anything. It's this great power. It's almost like a veto power of saying, no, I don't believe that this is correct, therefore I don't accept it, and you can't make me accept it. And that is what gives this network an incredible level of robustness. I've referred to it as kind of the power of no or the power of apathy, that because we have tens of thousands of of individual nodes, various entities on the network that can very easily reject anything they don't like, it is pretty much impossible for you to get bad data to replicate through the network. It is pretty much impossible to fool the entire Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole. Okay, so you can so you can run a a full node then without having to be effectively a miner as well. You can just verify the transactions, but not search for the block reward. Correct. Uh, If you are mining, then at least someone needs to be running a node. Uh, These days, mining is so specialized that you usually just connect to a pool and the operator of that mining pool is the one who is running the node. Uh, But essentially, if you are mining, you are grabbing transactions, you are constructing a valid block because if it's invalid, you're going to get rejected by the network and you're not going to get paid. And... Once you find a block, if you're lucky enough to find a block by by getting the correct uh, proof of work that everyone will agree meets the required uh, difficulty, the computational difficulty, then you can broadcast it out on the network. Everyone validates it. They come to a consensus and they say, okay, you created a a block. We're going to add it to the blockchain and we're going to reward you with these new bitcoins and the transaction fees. So how does CASA then fit into all of this? And what's the sort of overall objective of CASA? So our our primary goal at CASA is to help empower individuals and to help improve personal sovereignty. And those, these are very broad goals. But the way that we do that is by attacking both of those two levels of sovereignty that I referred to earlier. Uh, the first product that we came out with was CASA Keymaster, which is uh, Android and iOS mobile app which makes it extremely simple for you to create a multi-signature wallet. We started out with three of five multi-sig. We now also offer two of three multi-sig. And we also have a single sig just for regular spending. But 
the the trick that we did here was we melded um, extremely friendly uh, interface on these mobile apps with the extreme level of security that you get from hardware devices like Trezors and Ledgers. And so you're, you're actually managing the keys, or the keys themselves are stored on these hardware devices, but you're using our very simple and, and well-designed mobile app to visualize your security, to manage your uh, various devices. And we took it a step further to both make it more secure and more usable by actually getting rid of the need for the user to manage the seed phrases, the recovery data for the private keys. And the way that we did that was we basically created a more flexible system where if one of your hardware devices stops working or gets stolen or lost or whatever, instead of having to go through and dig up through potentially some arcane backup system where you're trying to keep this seed phrase uh, secure and robustly stored in a way that won't get lost, all you have to do is go buy a new Trezor or Ledger and plug it in and, and basically click through our wizard in our software to do a key rotation. And the reason why we think that that is a great improvement is because when you get a hardware device and you set it up and it tells you, okay, put this seed phrase somewhere and keep it safe, we believe there's actually an entire iceberg of... of security and IT knowledge underneath that sentence that the vast majority of people aren't going to understand, they aren't even going to think about, and they're going to shoot themselves in the foot by making any number of very simple mistakes, uh, such as, for example, just only having one backup of their seed phrase and maybe their house burns down. Maybe they have it on a piece of paper. And, and this has actually happened, by the way. Their maid comes in and thinks it's trash and throws it away. I mean, we have heard dozens, if not hundreds, of kind of sob stories of very, very simple mistakes that people have made that have ended up being catastrophic. And so by completely eliminating the need for people to figure out how to manage seed phrases and rather just say, okay, these are your five devices and you know where those are and you're visualizing them and we're providing you with like health check opportunities to make sure you still have them and they work. It's, it's basically baking the best practices of uh, private key management into the software so that the user doesn't have to go spend a ton of time educating themselves. All they have to do is open the app and, and uh, use the interfaces that we're providing to them. I'm I'm looking at my dog sitting next to me rather warily that he may eat my private key. Better not. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure that has happened to someone. Dog ate my homework meets dog ate my private key. How uh, very meta. Um, so, um, okay, so that's a really great overview of Casa and it sort of serves as a reminder to get a, uh, a Casa node installed ASAP uh, because I, I must admit I don't have one yet so I, I apologize there Jameson. Um, but let's step back a bit and um, maybe get somewhat philosophical. So um, one of the things we wanted to talk about was what your big picture view of the world today is um, and then what, we, what we'll do from there is sort of dig into the importance of security, privacy uh, and your philosophy around it. So, you know, where do you think where do you, if you sit back and kind of uh, uh, mull it over, where do you, how do you see things from an economic, geopolitical, and a technological um, standpoint at the moment? You know, are we in a in moving towards ever more authoritarian, totalitarian regimes? Are we seeing the rise of um, <clears throat> somewhat subversive technologies? Is technology good or bad, or somewhere in between? Um, what are your, what are your views on the big picture? I think the world is becoming a weirder place, and there's no way to stop that. I think it is a, a natural result of communications technology making it easier to see the diversity of perspectives and opinions that people have, um, and, and also making it easier for, I guess, the fringe 
perspectives to find each other and group together and kind of become more powerful and amplify their voices, uh, really resulting in much more polarized uh, discourse. So it's it's odd because I think that very few people thought that it would go this way. It's It's kind of like in the early days of the internet, I think a lot of people were really excited about how improved communications were going to, you know, make everyone more knowledgeable because you know, the sum of human knowledge would be at your fingertips. But I, I think few people really visualized kind of the opposite happening where it would also make it extremely easy to um, propagate falsehoods, uh, you know, fake news uh, or just, uh, extreme opinions to, to amplify those and and kind of brainwash people into thinking really crazy you know completely out there ideas and and so that kind of goes to your your question at a high level like both economic and geopolitical and everything i think that it's just more volatile i think that we we kind of we see advancements happening um in many directions at at very extremes and then the clashes that result from it are, are really what make this world uh, seem like a much crazier place these days so yeah. what is going to happen with technology i mean it's it's kind of a question of like you know is is this a trend that will continue forever or will we we figure out a way to reconcile these things uh, that is kind of the the million dollar question. I mean, we've we've created technologies that can improve privacy, and simultaneously, we've created technologies that strip privacy away. And unfortunately, I think that that you know it's a losing battle because it is very tempting for people to give up the privacy, but because they don't really see the value in it until it's too late, and so they give up their privacy in return for various conveniences. Yeah, I saw someone post on, on Twitter that um, they weren't really worried about giving away their data because they had an unlimited data plan on their mobile contract. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was genius. Um, but it just goes to show not everybody gets it or the danger. Um, uh, staying in that kind of uh, vein, there's two shows that I watched recently on, on Netflix. Uh, one about, um, I think it's Beyond the Curve, it's called, uh, about the emergence of the flat earth um, phenomena or the re-emergence of that. I, I think when you said the world is maybe getting a bit crazier, I think I'd, I'd add that into the sort of mix there. I hope you're not a flat earther there, uh, Jameson, but it's um, it's certainly out there. And there's a whole cohort of people um, that have found enough evidence to um, to sort of fit their own narrative. And then they, they just live in, a, in an echo chamber. Um, but sort of moving on from that slightly, um, there's another um, show that I saw recently, which is getting a bit of press and publicity at the moment, covering Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Um, and it's called uh, The Great Hack. Um, I was wondering, just before we move on to your thoughts about privacy and security, what you, what, if you've seen it, what you thought about it, and if you haven't seen it more generally, um, you know, did, um, did Cambridge Analytica do anything wrong? Or did Facebook do anything wrong? Or if people are giving this data um, up willingly, actually, should we be surprised that private enterprises are using that and implementing kind of nudge theory to, to get their own uh, outcomes? Um, and that could extend to political elections as well. I did get to see the flat earther one. That was hilarious. Uh, you know, I, I, I was <laughs> I was interested in that for a number of reasons, including uh, you know similar types of things that we've seen in the crypto space, where people are creating echo chambers and kind of propagating their own ideology. Um, I did not get to see the the great hack, though I've heard plenty of people talk about it. But is it's actually it's kind of funny because one of my favorite classes when I was in school that I actually ended up being a teaching assistant for was computer ethics. And computer ethics is a really hard thing to get your mind around because of unintended consequences and kind of second order effects of what happens. And, you know, one of my favorite examples, and this I think went way back to the, the 1960s or 70s, one of the first real uh, conflicts 
of computer ethics was the development of these early x-ray machines uh, that were run by computer software. And there ended up being some bugs where in certain cases they would overdose and basically irradiate and give a lethal dose of, of radiation to the patient, therefore killing them instead of saving them. And you end up with these really tough questions of, you know, who is to blame? You know, the, the programmer was trying to save people. They were trying to write code and, and manipulate data in a way that would improve a person's life. And I think that in, in many cases, you know, we as programmers are trying to do that, but we are narrowly focused on a very specific problem that we're trying to solve. And I'm not sure that it is even feasible to ask for uh, software engineers. Um, I'm not even sure if it's feasible to ask at a greater level of like organizations to think about or be cognizant of what the unintended consequences, what the second order effects of what you're doing really are going to be. I mean, it's kind of like asking people to predict the future. And this is another reason why I think the world is becoming a crazier place is because we are able to manipulate things, you know, manipulate data, manipulate communications, and, and ultimately manipulate perception. And the only way to know what, what happens as a result is to do it. I mean, we're basically running experiments at a rate that has never been seen before. And, and the question becomes, you know, how do we shut down or reverse these experiments if they are deemed to be too risky? And, and that's where I think you start to see government and regulators come in, uh, you know, trying to kind of save us from ourselves. But it, they very well may do the same thing and create unintended consequences that just, you know, make even weirder and worse things happen. So the, this is, um, as far as I am aware, it's like not really a solvable problem. We just kind of have to wing it and hope that we don't destroy ourselves in the process. This, lead, this leads us on very nicely to my next question, actually, because we, in the day job and the work that we do, we end up talking a lot about what's the future role of the government as a state um, going forward. And I guess it'd be good to kind of dig into some of your your personal beliefs around the role of government, the role of money, the role of uh, freedom, or what freedom actually is. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, like a lot of people in this space, I think I, I end up falling back to a lot of the, the principles or at least... Um, thoughts that were, were pinned in the, the sovereign individual and pinned in the uh, crypto anarchist manifesto of you know how technology at a very high level is going to affect the world over the coming generations. Um, but also, like I said before, it's going to be some of column A and some of column B where technology is going to continue to empower individuals. And, and that is my own manifesto of uh, a number of years ago when I decided to go full-time Bitcoin, I decided that I was no longer going to think of myself as just a computer scientist who is solving interesting problems. Rather, I decided that my, my career goal is to improve uh, the power of the individual because I think that there's already plenty of people and entities out there who are working to strip away the power of the individual, and I feel like I contributed to that in my early career, and that uh, if I can try to do as much as I can to push against that tide, uh, I will at least be able to sleep at night. Uh, I don't know how effective I will be individually, but hopefully if I can also influence other people to have a similar perspective to myself, then we can you know, unite kind of in in a, a good cause together to, to try to, to save humanity from authoritarianism. <laughs> so, so uh, talking about practical aspects of that then, so how do you practically go about achieving personal or operational security? It is 
it's difficult because you have to actually think about it. It is not the default. And so if you if you aren't really holding this as a, a, a dear value to your life, then what you'll find is you don't have any privacy. Like going about uh, your normal life the way that pretty much everybody does, the way that we are conditioned to, you're going to be giving your data away left and right. You're going to be, you know, broadcasting your your location, your movements, your prob- possibly even like your every thought that comes into your head if you're addicted to social media, and and all of this data is going to get absorbed, and you don't know how that data is going to get used. Um, you know, mostly it's going to get used for marketing purposes, but. The thing about data that that I think most people don't fully appreciate is how information has a property where it it just replicates like crazy. It, the, often we hear you know information wants to be free, and and that doesn't mean free as in cheap. It means free as in freedom, as in as soon as you make a piece of data public, you should basically assume that the entire world will eventually know it at this point because of how hyper-connected we all are. Where even if you're putting sensitive data into a quote-unquote you know, secure database, um, it's eventually going to leak out. And I mean, we see this happen almost every day, definitely every week, where, um, what is it, was... Just in the past week, I think uh, uh, we had like one, I think, yeah, Capital US. One was like a hundred million yeah. plus mm-hmm. people um, yeah. who had a lot of their sensitive data leaked. And I mean, this is just becoming such a regular occurrence that we've become desensitized to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know how many people actually th- think about that ahead of time, but we certainly don't seem to have a lot of uproar as a result of it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't recall hearing about like people protesting outside of the offices of of Equifax or or Capital One or any of these other companies after all their data gets lost. And I think part of that reason may be simply that it's, um, it's so widespread, um, you know, across, you know, hundreds of millions of people where the, even the folks who do end up being directly impacted by it and having their identity stolen or whatever, in many cases, it's not, obvious or not possible to tell what the source of that was. All you really know is that your data got stolen. Um, you can't exactly track you know, who lost your data in the first place. And your data is, is, is in so many places that uh, it, it's almost a lost cause unless you, you go to the extreme like I did and basically like burn down your entire life and start over again from scratch with a, a focus on not giving your data to basically anybody. And I'm really interested to dig into that again um, uh, to, to understand whether you are, in fact, Gene Hackman out of Enemy of the State living inside some kind of metal cage. Um, but uh, before we do that, I think you, you raise a really interesting point about what is the second order, third order, order magnitude um, outcome as a result of these activities? If there's a data hack, I think you know if you're if you're personally threatened in the street, um, or, or there's something physical um, happens, you understand that there's a risk, and you know you're going to take precautions against that event or that outcome happening again. With a data hack, it's it nothing happens. You know you don't know what the outcome is until perhaps years later when um, perhaps your identity's been stolen or um, something else has happened. And I think um, one of the things that we've been talking about and thinking about recently is where's the future going for China? You know with a sort of a state, a centralized state that has access and control of so much data. And when it's implementing social credit scores, um, it's only at that point, really, that you realize, oh, OK, I've been giving this data away. They've been watching, farming, analyzing and creating all kinds of profiles. And now here comes the uh, the bad news. I can't get a loan or I can't get a mortgage on my house. My kids can't go to private school because I haven't necessarily been the best citizen. Um, and I saw this week, actually, that um, there's even tracking and monitoring on screens in, in airports, I think, in China uh, that shows where uh, where toilets are. So 
it shows a live image of the toilets that are in use, um, which stalls are full um, or, or being um, being used. So you literally can't go to the toilet without the Chinese government taking some kind of record of the event. So, um, yeah, just your, your thoughts on the second order, third order magnitude impacts of those things would be interesting. I think one of the more concerning things is what is going to happen if you try to opt out of all of this? You know, at, at what point is the government going to you know, put their foot down and say, no, this is, this is not something you can opt out of. If you don't let us track you, then we're basically going to ruin your life. And it does seem like China will probably be sort of the test bed for that. Um, I'm I'm fairly hopeful that you know countries that are more steeped in ideologies of freedom will be able to resist it. But then the question is, how long will they be able to resist it? Will it only be for a generation or a few generations? Is this something that will inevitably you know take over the whole world? Uh, I think you also can get into some interesting theories around sort of global one world government uh, type situations. You know, will the world become so hyper connected that even the governments uh, merge and begin to realize that you know physical boundaries are, are kind of silly? Um, may, maybe we need to have some sort of alien invasion to in unite us all uh, before that happens, but who knows? Don't go off uh, the earth on us, Jameson. <laughs> You've been on for half an hour and we've sent you to aliens. Okay. Uh, or, or a visit from future me. Exactly. So, you know, all we can really do is, is fight against it as much as possible and hope that we can stave off this uh, eventual panopticon of, of governments. Um, there's also, of course, the, the question of whether or not we can create systems that eventually make governments uh, less powerful. You know, there are some theories that, you know, a sound money like Bitcoin could weaken the power of the states by removing their ability to print money, which is, you know, essentially just a, a more subversive form of taxation. Um, you know, there are theories that if governments can't fund their war machines by printing tons of money that, you know, that may reduce the, the amount of, of resources that are spent on uh, destructive technologies and, and perhaps we'll have more, uh, at least relatively more investment in constructive technologies. But um, it's, it's going to be a never ending battle. And, and I think that the allure of, of capturing and ingesting absolutely every bit of data that you can in order to analyze it is it's it's power it's just a new form of currency in to, in and of itself because when you become basically omniscient um, you can start to influence people. You can start to create new rules and basically force them on people, uh, possibly even without them knowing it. Um, that is, is where we're getting into some interesting questions that I think, you know, came up around the last election cycle in the United States where, you know, people have, are saying, well, you know, there's political influence uh, of Russia and the United States, and they're basically using our own algorithms against us by, you know, having troll farms and bots and whatever uh, push different messages out to, to basically uh, train the suggestion algorithms on these platforms, which then will amplify specific messages, even if it's a message that is extreme and not believed by many people if you amplify it enough you might actually be able to, to convince enough people that this is the truth this is something they need to believe and then as a result actually start to create almost a groundswell movement of uh, essentially convincing people do you it's a it's a random question but a thought that comes to mind is do you think that we're potentially in the future going to end up with a general generational divide between those that get this entirely because they're of a younger generation they've been brought up 
understanding the power of their own personal data from day one versus those that are of the older generations who have kind of grown up with it but don't really care that is a good question i'm uh, i guess i i don't really know enough younger people to understand their perspective on data and privacy um just a thought it is you know it, it i i'm sure there are going to be generational divides like we're already seeing that um you, you know children that are are coming up in the the internet connected age where they're they're using apps basically as early as toddler age uh, I think that their their brains are you know conditioned to this new type of interface, this new environment, this new hyper connected world, uh, much better than even I am. Um, you know, I see stark contrast between uh, the the folks who are teenagers and younger uh, versus myself, where I got into technology when I was in like you know middle school, high school age, versus my own parents who you know can barely use a keyboard and don't understand you know web interfaces and uh you know the ability to interact uh, interactively with a number of these different interfaces is much more difficult for them so this this is also just one of those things where it's very hard to say how the world and is going to keep continue evolving because humans adapt so quickly um you know it it may it may not be that the existing generations adapt to something, but the next generation who never knew anything else will uh, very easily absorb and and start to uh, respond to these these new technologies, probably in ways that we can't even imagine. Very true. So, how, so going back a bit, then, so how did talk us through how you uh, achieved control? How did you wipe that slate clean? How did you drop off the grid? Well, I started by reading several privacy-centric uh, books, and, and those were good to set a groundwork for kind of uh, real-world or meat-space privacy. Uh, there, weren't, there weren't very many good uh, digital privacy books because I think it's a much newer phenomenon. So for, for more of the digital privacy stuff, I had to do a lot of, of online research. But essentially... Um, you basically had to start from like first principles of like what what is the most basic data of yours that is important that can potentially be used against you, and so that is things like you know your actual your identity, your location, um, your ownership of various assets, and anything that is a public record. Um, you know usually government records um, that legally must be available for people to to be able to search through and and find the results of. And so I, I kind of started off with that and saying, okay, I need any public records that have my name on them not to have my location on them. And you know, how do you get around that? Well, Unfortunately, this becomes a legal problem, and it is different for every jurisdiction. And in many jurisdictions, you probably don't have a good solution to it. But at least in the United States, we have uh, the ability to create corporate entities. And there are certain states where you can create corporate entities that obscure the owner of the entity. And you can basically have what is often referred to as anonymous LLCs or even kind of like shell corporations, you know, corporations within corporations within corporations. And, and essentially it, you can kind of think of it as like, you know, using the, the structure of our own legal system to, to protect yourself against your own legal system. Um, it really starts with that. And then once you have that foundation, you then, have to realize that every time you put your your information into any website, into any database, uh, really, it, anytime you give your information to any third-party provider, you have to assume that they're going to either give it 
they're going to give it to other people either willingly or unwillingly just due to the nature of data and information wanting to be free. And um, that basically means you have to do one of two things. You either have to use a proxy of some sort. And this proxy, many people think of proxies in terms of the internet and network props, proxies like VPNs. Um, but you can use proxies in terms of uh, legal entities in terms of other humans, you know, friends, family, uh, attorneys, basically to uh, create a firewall between yourself and your real information and whatever it is all these third parties have. So you can either do that with proxies or you can just lie to them. And and so it it it, it varies case by case on every different interaction I have, but. I'm basically either giving these like proxy uh, corporate information to third parties or I'm just giving them junk because it's not illegal for me to lie to, to you know, a, um, a random website that I sign up for and give them a fake address. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. Like there's in many cases, uh, companies are asking for far more data than they actually need in order for you to maintain a relationship with them. And so I'll, I'll give them an email address that's not connected to me. Um, I'll use a, a throwaway credit card that can't be traced to me. It doesn't have my name on it. Um, it, it ultimately results in you having to understand all of these possible different interactions, uh, and there's far too many of them to list here, but I have a very in-depth article on my blog that, that lists every interaction that I've had to change my own behavior for uh, in order to protect my own information. And I, am I right in saying, I did hear an, an interview with you previously, when all of this, um, not training, but I guess this uh, that you'd put into practice actually came into use one day when uh, you, you were the subject of what's called a SWAT attack. Is that right? Or was that, yes, as, or, that did you, or did you take all this action as a result of that? Uh, it was as a result of that. Um, right. It was it was when my entire neighborhood was shut down by the police, and I had uh, a dozen or so officers with rifles surrounding my house. That I realized that any really anyone with the slightest modicum of of internet savvy could find my physical address, and then could use a uh, throw away uh, voice over IP telephony service to place a phone call to my local police department and claim that they were me and that I had murdered a bunch of people and ha were holding other people hostage and essentially uh, leverage their knowledge of technology in order to use the force of the state against me. And that was really the scary thing was, you know, I've been a libertarian for a long time. I, I've, you know, generally been anti-government in a variety of different ways. But I always thought that, you know, as long as I was a good citizen, I didn't break uh, any major laws, I didn't hurt anyone, that I didn't have to worry about the state actually threatening me. I never thought that the state may have created a bunch of exploits that could be used by other random people against me. And the swatting thing is one of the more extreme variants. But we, uh, at least over the past couple of years, I've heard a number of people tell me about a variety of other ways that resources of the state have been uh, basically aimed at them by random third parties. Uh, some examples of this uh, are child protective services. You know, people can submit anonymous complaints against you and claim that you're abusing your children in some way, and you'll you'll have agents of the state knocking on your door. Um, another example is, um, as you're probably aware, I'm also an avid firearm enthusiast, and we have an organization called the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency which it turns out people can also submit tips and complaints to. And I've heard of people who have essentially been uh, red flagged 
uh, as a result of that and have you know, gone to go to try to purchase a firearm and been refused because there is a flag in the system that they may be dangerous, they may be involved in terrorism, and basically there's an active investigation going on because someone submitted a tip that they need to be looked into. And so um, I'm sure there are a variety of other ways as well. You know, there's just so many different government organizations that have various, you know, law enforcement arms that um, the the only way to protect yourself against a number of these types of attacks is to make it so that anonymous people can't tell the government, you know, go look at this person, go kick down their door. I bet the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms Agency and Explosives Agency have the best Christmas parties, though. Quite possibly. <laughs> um, okay, that's really interesting and um, sort of taken us down a route that uh, not many of our other sort of um, sessions have gone down on the importance of privacy. Um, to sort of bring this uh, full circle as we're kind of approaching the end, um, what are your views on the importance then of, of Bitcoin? Um, do you think um, Bitcoin should have privacy uh, embedded into it or a privacy option? Or do you think it's more important to have uh, almost a kind of bimetallic standard, a, uh, a standard where Bitcoin perhaps could be the base settlement and other protocols, Zcash or Monero, um, could serve as those privacy coins? Um, and then also scalability, you know, longer term for Bitcoin, is Bitcoin the one uh, protocol that we want to get behind? Um, or will this uh, diverse portfolio of cryptocurrencies that the state can't necessarily influence and control um, emerge? What are your views? Well, I think that there are going to be a plethora of protocols out there, but I think there are a number of reasons why we see that even after 10 years, Bitcoin is still dominant, uh, despite the fact that you could argue that other protocols may have been more advanced in different ways. Um, you know, personally, I'm, I'm a big fan of these uh, privacy-oriented protocols, whether it's uh, Zcash, Monero, Grin. Uh, I find them all very interesting. Um, all of these things, of course, are still experiments. Even Bitcoin is still an experiment. We're, we're still trying to improve it. It's, it's a long way from being a like 1.0 uh, solid product. It's not done by any means, but I think that it's it's tricky just from a usability perspective. Um, I may have a better grasp on the complexities because I've worked on wallet software for a number of years. But what you find is that when you're trying to manage uh, a dozen or even dozens of different uh, crypto assets, it becomes a real pain because there is not a whole lot of good management software that supports all of these things. And so you end up having you know, a dozen different wallets potentially. Um, and e even some of the wallets that do support every crypto asset under the sun, um, often they are like software only wallets and essentially what you're doing is you're putting all of your private keys for all of your crypto assets into one piece of software, which I find to be a very scary proposition. You know, you're basically creating a single point of failure um, for long term holding as well. I only really advocate that people use multi signature wallets for long term holding. If you want to eliminate single points of failure, you can't be using a single signature wallet. But um, you know, should privacy be added to Bitcoin? I think that it's inevitable. There, there are a number of people who are working on it, but the type of privacy that you see being developed for Bitcoin is not the same as what you see on other networks, mainly due to the constraints of how difficult it is to change the protocol um, and the extreme conservatism of the developers. So instead of seeing really uh, cutting edge, you know, unique cryptographic constructions getting added to Bitcoin. Instead, we see um, basically ways of minimizing and aggregating data so that you can have a lot of people who are interacting with the protocol, but they're doing it in a way that they're basically hiding in the crowd. Um, so we're, we're seeing, you know, improvements 
in the line of aggregate signatures, for example. Um, we're seeing improvements in the line of being able to hide your your basically your scripts, your your complexity of your scripts so that you're not putting them all on the public blockchain. You're only revealing the minimum amount of data that is necessary to, to do your business. Um, and then, of course, you're seeing these second layer networks as well. You're seeing uh, both Lightning Network and then you're seeing side chains like RSK and Liquid where you may be able to leverage more uh, creative uh, cryptographic constructions on there to, to have better privacy as well. But it's, it's definitely got a long way to go. And it's, it's really hard to say how long it's going to be before we really believe that like Bitcoin can, can no longer really be analyzed. Um, that there's just so many different, I guess, types of, of attacks that can happen. It's not just about like on-chain analysis. You also have to worry about people who are, are listening to the network. You also have to worry about the fact that there's a lot of uh, third-party custodians that are doing AML KYC and probably you know leaking your, your personal data to other analysis companies or, or government agencies. And so... Um, there, there's a lot more to it than just protocol changes. I think we also need to have uh, you know, better way to actually uh, it, have on-ramps and off-ramps, for example, that don't require you to give up a lot of private information. So if you so if you were to pick a kind of a leading protocol then, who would you who would you kind of look at? Would you look at someone like Monero or Zcash or uh, even member Wimble? I like Monero and Mimblewimble the most, um, mainly from a like practical standpoint. My main problem with Zcash is that while they have a, a great uh, level of like potential privacy, the the vast majority of wallet software out there doesn't actually support it. So last I checked, you know, 99% of Zcash transactions were unshielded, meaning that they have no different level of privacy than a regular Bitcoin transaction because it is a fork of Bitcoin. So, you know, if we can get to the point where, and I, I know the Zcash folks have been talking about this, but if they can get to the point where the shielded transactions are like the default and possibly even the mandatory, you know, only possibility, then I think it, Zcash would be a much stronger uh, network in terms of privacy. Cool. Um, Jameson, we're about out of time, but it wouldn't be an episode of Crypto and Grill before discussing uh, what you would put on the barbecue. So uh, let's flash forward um, into a dystopian future um, where um, you and your secret band of other um, pseudo spooks are invited to your lair for a barbecue um, to celebrate completely breaking um, away from the, the system. Um, what are you going to put on the barbecue to keep everyone fed and happy? Um, and uh, yeah, what's your what's your choice? Well, it really depends on how much time I have. As much but, time um... as you want. It's your event, Jameson. <laughs> you can have a week, a month, however long you want. Well, um, I'm a, a big fan of nice, you know, slow roasted rack of ribs. Good choice. I think that was my choice way back at, at the beginning. Excellent. <laughs> well, look, uh, this has been fantastic.